I'll be talking about the definition of failure to thrive, the pathophysiology, how we break down the different causes of failure to thrive, how to diagnose it, um, that's including some tips on what to ask during the interview to help you lead you in the right direction, as well as a differential diagnosis for failure to thrive. So let's get started. First, we have a definition of failure to thrive. Failure to thrive is when you have a pediatric patient who fails to gain weight or inappropriately loses weight. Now, as I mentioned, the pathophysiology can help us break down what the actual cause of the failure to thrive is. In general, the nutritional intake of the baby does not support normal growth and development. And there are three broad categories. This could be because of inadequate calorie intake. This could be because of malabsorption, where the calories are going into the gut lumen, but not necessarily making it into the blood, um, into the actual body. And it can be because of increased metabolic demand. The baby's getting all the calories, the baby's absorbing the calories, but the baby's body requires more calories than other babies, or the baby's body is kind of malfunctioning and not using those resources properly. To diagnose failure to thrive, we typically plot these curves for height, weight, and head circumference. Here's an example of one such curve from the CDC. I know the WHO has a similar curve, but you can see they have length on this axis and age on the x-axis. And uh, you could plot that and make sure the baby's tracking along with what the averages are uh, for, that, for that age group. Each of these lines represents one percentile. So in the middle, we have the 50th percentile. So 50% of babies will be at this weight at this age. And um, you have 75th and percentiles above and below that. If you notice a baby dropping off of a growth curve, that means falling below two, at least two, percentile spaces. That's at least two of these lines. And if their height or height for weight are the third bar or below, that would be concerning for failure to thrive. So let me try to make that a little easier. If you have a baby that's tracking along the 50th percentile and all of a sudden they drop two major lines and all of a sudden they're in the fifth percentile, that would be concerning for failure to thrive. If you have a baby that never even made it that high and they've just been tracking along below the third percentile their entire life, that's also concerning for failure to thrive. In failure to thrive, you typically expect the weight to drop first, um, then the height, then the head circumference. Weight loss, it's important to note that weight loss is normal after birth. Um, this is usually a pretty minor weight loss, so less than 10% of the baby's birth weight, and the baby should regain that in three weeks. Essentially, when the baby's in utero, they're full of water um, because they're underwater the entire time. And uh, For a week or two after, after birth, they can kind of lose some of that water and they can lose weight, but um, that should be temporary. It shouldn't be mu that much weight loss, and they should regain the weight pretty quickly. So some tips during the interview, you want to ask about their feeds, how frequently is the baby feeding, how much is the baby eating, how does the baby, or how do the parents mix the formulas for the baby. One of the causes of failure to thrive is pr improperly mixed formula. Um, baby's not able to absorb the formula if it's all chunky or grainy um, instead of nice solution. You also want to ask about the stools, how frequently is the baby producing stools, how much stool is the baby producing, what's the consistency and the color of the stools. And more subtly, you want to look out for abuse. You don't want to ask about this directly, of course, but be on the lookout for suspicious wounds or bruises. Um, suspicious bruises means, for instance, bruises in various locations of the body or bruises in different stages of healing, indicating different injuries over uh, different periods of time, as well as bruises or injuries that are not consistent with the, with the parents or the caretaker's story. Some more obvious signs of abuse maybe are circular burns, which might indicate a baby being poked with a hot cigarette, and water dunk burns, which, which is when the, the baby has a burn that isn't in a splash mark, but rather over the ankles, the butt, and the feet only, as if the baby was dunked into a hot bath or into a hot sink um, and was, uh, was dunked in butt, ankle, feet first. Uh, lastly, of course, if the baby is running from the caretaker or uh, visibly scared of the caretaker, that's a sign for failure to thrive. So next, let's look at this differential for failure to thrive. As I said, there are three broad categories. We'll start with inadequate calorie intake. First is inadequate food supply. This is the number one etiology globally um, caused by poverty, a poor understanding of feeding. Um, there's insufficient food supply from the bottle or from the breast. So you might be too poor to afford food or the mom's breast production might be insufficient. You might need to supplement. Secondly is postpartum depression or maternal depression. The moms with postpartum depression are at increased risk for breastfeeding difficulty, and that can result in inadequate calorie intake. Next is the number one cause in the, in the United States, which is child neglect. 
Um, the statistics I saw were 5 to 10%, seems pretty high, but um, that leads to inadequate calorie intake. Next is a structural deficit, the cleft lip and cleft palate. This can be unilateral or bilateral. Um, the baby can have the Howard or the soft palate affected, or both. This is usually apparent on exam. Um, the baby will have impaired motor coordination, which leads to poor suck and poor swallow. You can repair the lips at 10 to 12 weeks. You can repair the palate a little bit later when they're almost a year old at 10 to 12 months. And uh, if you don't do these repairs, the baby is predisposed to having speech, feeding, hearing problems in the future, as well as otitis media. It uh, messes up the drainage of the middle ear. So cleft lip and cleft palate can lead to failure to thrive. Next is GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. The baby will be notably irritable, fussy. Uh, they might spit up after feeds. The pathophysiology is essentially a short esophagus. Um, baby's pretty small. The stomach is pretty close uh, to the mouth. It's a short esophagus, so they can feel that reflux more than a, a taller adult would. Um, baby also has partial lower esophageal sphincter closure and it's worse when the baby is lying supine. The treatment for this is smaller feeds. You might need to feed the baby more frequently and smaller volumes. You can also do tummy time after meals. Helps a little bit too. This essentially resolves when the baby gets taller, um, when the esophagus isn't as short, when the lower esophageal sphincter isn't as small and tight, and when the baby doesn't lie supine as frequently. So that's by one to two years old. Next is malrotations. This is uh, the intestines rotating improperly during development. You can diagnose this on an x-ray. The ultrasound might show a GI tract cutoff, so that would be obvious on ultrasound as well. This predisposes the child to volvulus, which is when the gut twists around its mesenteric blood supply. And the symptoms you'll see are nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, uh, distension of the abdomen. And on x-ray, you might see a large dilated loop of bowel. The treatment here is corrective surgery. So if a baby has malrotation or volvulus, they, they might need surgery to fix that. Next is pyloric stenosis. This usually happens in boys, usually from two to eight weeks. The baby will have forceful projectile vomiting, um, is the classic story you see. Not just spitting up after feeds or burping on mom, but projectile vomiting that goes uh, pretty fast, pretty far. The exam will show an olive-shaped mass, even though this isn't that common. So if they don't have an olive-shaped mass in the abdomen, um, it could still be pyloric stenosis. They'll also, you'll also see peristaltic waves. That's essentially the stomach contracting against a very tight pyloric sphincter. The diagnosis here is low potassium. Uh, sorry, on, on blood work, you can diagnose this with low potassium, low chloride. These are essentially signs of vomiting, uh, as well as metabolic alkalosis. This makes sense. If they're barfing up all the hydrogen chloride in their body, they'll be alkalotic, and they'll have low uh, chloride. You can see a donut sign on ultrasound. That's essentially the olive-shaped olive um, pyloric sphincter. The treatment for babies are IV fluids and surgeries. They'll actually cut open that sphincter, uh, make it easier for the, for the stomach to drain into the intestines. Other causes are cerebral palsy and hypotonia and avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. Um, those are a little less common, so I won't cover them here. Next is this category of malabsorption. Um, and first is food protein-induced proctocolitis. This is an allergy, but it's not like the allergy that people get to peanuts. This is a non-IgE mediated allergy. So it means uh, no anaphylaxis, it means no hives. Essentially what the babies get is fussy after feeds. They might vomit and they usually have bloody stool when they consume cow's milk. Some babies are also affected by soy. This happens in two to three percent of babies. Um, they essentially just get fussy whenever they have cow's milk. So the solution is to switch to hydrolyzed formula and to try cow's milk again at two or three years old. So most babies outgrow this. Um, so this is a, an allergy, but not like your normal IgE-mediated, histamine-mediated allergies. You can also have some bowel problems, like celiac disease. I cover that more in a, in a different video. And short bowel syndrome. In kids, necrotizing enterocolitis is the most common cause of short bowel syndrome. Cystic fibrosis can lead to malabsorption. This is an autosomal recessive mutation of the CFTR gene. This is the cystic fibrosis transmembrane receptor. It can cause a meconium ileus, which essentially causes failure to pass meconium. The diagnosis here is on the newborn screen. Babies are genetically tested for cystic fibrosis. Um, alternatively, the mother might notice that the baby has a salty taste, that their sweat is saltier um, than the mom's own sweat. And for this, you could do a sweat chloride test. And the normals for that or the abnormals for that, sorry, are over than over 40 in infants and over 60 in pediatrics, uh, older children. People with cystic fibrosis essentially will be malnourished. 
you could supplement their pancreatic enzymes. Uh, their, you do want to supplement their, their vitamins that they cannot absorb. So that's the DEEK vitamins. These are all the fat-soluble vitamins that they'll have trouble absorbing um, because they don't have lipase produced by the, by the pancreas. These people will get repeated respiratory infections. So to resolve that, you could do uh, pulmonary toilets, and you do want to treat pseudomonas in these patients since they're predisposed to these infections. Men will have infertility. It's the same mechanism. It's these uh, tubes, the vas deferens in the, in the scrotum that isn't able to carry um, some, some sperm. So men will be infertile. Kyphoscoliosis, so they'll have uh, improper back spine positioning. Um, digital clubbing as well is another sign you might see. Another one is biliary atresia. The symptoms here are failure to thrive, as well as jaundice, acolic stools, that's light-colored stools. Uh, the diagnosis here is with high direct bilirubin, and an ultrasound can show no ducts uh, coming from, the, coming from the, um, the biliary system, coming from the liver and the gallbladder. Treatment here is surgery. Uh, you wanna try to salvage the, the liver, and that's a procedure called the Kasai procedure. Lastly is this category of increased metabolic demand. Um, you can have hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism. Hyperthyroidism can cause failure to thrive with bulging eyes, tachycardia, irritability. So similar symptoms to what you see in adults. Hypothyroidism can cause constipation and poor feeding. Um, in general, the baby should be pretty eager to feed. If they're not eager or if they're sleeping all the time or if they're just not interested in food, it could be a sign of hypothyroidism. Chronic infections can cause increased metabolic demand resulting in failure to thrive. So that includes tuberculosis, HIV, and some of these immunodeficiencies in kids. So common variable immunodeficiency and severe combined immunodeficiency. We should also talk about the torch infections. These are congenital infections that can cause failure to thrive as well as anemias, jaundice, hepatosplenomegaly, chorioretinitis, and purpura. Um, these, there's five of these. The T stands for toxoplasmosis. This is a parasite that you get from cat poop or raw meat or soil. It can lead to brain calcifications, hearing and vision loss, and seizures. There's this other category, which refers to several viruses, but mostly syphilis. Um, babies with syphilis will get palms and uh, soles that are red. They have a rash on their palms and soles. They'll get saber shins that kind of bend outward. Uh, saddle nose and Hutchinson's teeth are worth looking up. The uh, saddle nose is kind of bent inward and kind of a kind of a bulbous nose. To diagnose syphilis in a child, you'll do the VDRL blood test and the RPR. And then you can confirm with a dark field microscopy or uh, this is an antibody test for syphilis. The treatment for syphilis as it is in adults is penicillin. Rubella is another uh, viral infection um, that, that babies can get. This shows up as a purpura. You, you sometimes hear about the blueberry muffin baby. They get these blue spots all over them, makes them look like a blueberry muffin. Babies can get cataracts, deafness, heart defects, and the treatment for rubella is just supportive. Next is sorry, cytomegalovirus, another herpes virus. This can cause periventricular calcifications in the brain, so you'll see that on brain imaging. You diagnose cytomegalovirus um, with urine and saliva, and you could do viral titers on those, and the PCR will also work on those as well. So you could you can PCR for, for CMV in the urine or in the saliva. Lastly of the torch infections is the herpes. Uh, virus. This is painful burning vesicles on an erythematous base, commonly described as dew drops on a rose petal. Diagnose this with PCR as well, and the treatment for this is acyclovir. Babies can also get inflammatory bowel disease. You'd want to differentiate between uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. This is pretty unusual in a baby, so it should be pretty low on your differential. Usually inflammatory bowel disease happens in, in uh, older patients. Another to be on the lookout for is diabetes mellitus. Um, this might show up as failure to thrive with polyuria, polyphagia, and polydipsia. You should also look out for congenital heart defects. This may initially present as a pan-systolic murmur, um, which might prompt you to do an echocardiogram, which can then show a ventricular septal defect. And if that uh, ventricular septal defect is not fixed, then you can have a change in the flow patterns of the heart called Eisenmenger syndrome. So normally the left ventricle uh, pumps a lot harder than the right ventricle and you'll have some left to right movement of blood so the shunt will be a left to right shunt. As this happens the right ventricle will get bigger you'll have right ventricular hypertrophy and eventually that shunt will change directions so the right ventricle will be bigger and when that happens the baby will be in respiratory distress. Um, it'll also cause backup of blood into their systemic circulation so the baby might also have an enlarged liver. Um, and of course that can cause failure to thrive because they're essentially shunting blood 
away from their lungs. Babies can also have chronic lung disease, that's bronchopulmonary dysplasia and bronchiectasis. And lastly, there are these kind of rare inborn errors of metabolism. So that's like the galactosemias, uh, baby might have bilateral cataracts and jaundice, and glyco glycogen storage disorders. So they'll have failure to thrive as well as hepatosplenomegaly and cirrhosis. So this was kind of a long uh, talk about things that should be on your differential if you have a patient that comes in with failure to thrive. First things to be on the lookout for are these in inadequate calorie intakes since they're more common. Um, there's some rarer stuff, some like systemic disorders here, some infections that you want to be on the lookout for too. I hope this was helpful and thank you for listening.